Good morning and welcome to Rahil Baptist Church for Sunday morning, October 23rd, 2016. This morning's message brought to us by Senior Pastor Michael Franklin and as part of the survey of the New Testament series is entitled, How to Know. God can take a lost sinner and make him a saint. Man, I, folks, that salvation is what that is. Never in my wildest dreams did I think I would grow up to be a pastor or a preacher. I really didn't. And folks, it humbles me. It humbles me to know what God has done through salvation. And I want to share a little of my testimony today because I was a lost church member. I made a decision when I was five years old and basically I wanted to be baptized and they took a picture of you, and I thought that was a pretty good, cute, cool deal when I was five. And I'll never forget what the man said at the end of the service. He said, if you don't want to go to hell, you get up here. Well, I was five years old, and I, was, I knew that. I didn't want to do that. But folks, I had no idea what salvation was at five. And then God called me again when I was 14 years old. I was at a huge youth camp in Oklahoma called Falls Creek. And on a Friday night, God did call me to salvation, and I did know what it meant but I was not ready to turn my life over to Jesus Christ. I wanted to change, but I wanted to do it in my time and in my way. And two, week, two months after I had made that decision that summer, I went back to high school. I started hanging around the same people. I started doing the very same things I did before I made a false profession of faith. And for eight years, I doubted my salvation. From the age of 14 to the age of 22, I had no assurance that if I died, I would go to heaven. I honestly didn't know. And there were times at night I would lay in my bed and I would think, what if Jesus came? What if Jesus came? And I, my answer to that was, I just don't know. But I can safely say, on August 23rd, 1983, we were in a coliseum of more than 3,000 people. Bailey Smith preached the sermon called The Wheat and the Tear. And I'm telling you, he described my life. On the outside, I looked good, but on the inside, I was empty inside. And I'm telling you, I walked that aisle that night. I gave my heart and my life to Christ. And here's the deal. Here's how I know I'm saved. God changed my life. What used to be important to me was not important anymore. What I wanted to do was not important anymore. I found Jesus Christ. He put the Holy Spirit in my life. And I'll be honest with you folks, it took me a little longer. I'm a slow learner, all right? It took me a little longer to totally walk in those footsteps. But I'm telling you, being a pastor and sharing the Word of God, as far as I'm concerned, is the greatest privilege I have had in my life. And I take it seriously. And the message today is going to be a serious one. Because I was sitting where some of you might be today. And folks, I'm giving you my life story. Peter is making sure, if you have your bulletins and want to follow along with, how to know. Do you know that you can know, you can know that if you died today, you would go to heaven. You can be 100% sure. Because I say that with all the confidence in the Word of God. Let me go ahead and give you the outline how to know, and you want to follow along in the bulletin. Number one, Christians, they pursue godliness. They pursue godliness. Number two, they have a fruitful life. They have a fruitful life. And number three, and this is very, very important, they listen to the Holy Spirit. They listen to the Holy Spirit. In 2 Peter 1, we're going to look at that chapter, but hold your finger there, and I want to start out with 1 John chapter 5. Just want to give you one verse as we launch out into how to know. How to know. You can know that you're saved. 1 John 5, verse 13. 1 John 5, 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know, K-N-O-W, that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son 
of God. I was raised in church. I went nine months before I was born. My parents went every time the doors were open. But folks, I am telling you, I did not know the Lord until I was 22 years old. And he is saying here, and, and folks, my problem is I had head knowledge. Christ was in my head, but he was not in my heart. And John here is saying, I am telling you, as a person, as a believer, you can know that you know that you know that you have eternal life. Folks, I'm telling you, it is the greatest feeling in the world. And we're going to show that to you here in just a second. Now, back to 2 Peter chapter 1. Let's look at three signs that you're saved. Three signs that you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Number one, you pursue godliness. You pursue godliness. Simon Peter, a bondservant, an apostle of Jesus Christ. See, in the other scripture, in 1 Peter, he just says Peter. But he uses Simon Peter because of what he's fixing to share with you. Simon was his old person. Simon was that brash, that bold, that guy that kind of opened his mouth before he thought about what he said. That guy that had trouble controlling his temper. All right, He took a sword and was whacking off ears when Jesus could take care of it all. Simon was before Jesus Christ. Peter was after Jesus Christ. Peter was renamed. And, and folks, think about this. Jesus renamed him Peter, which meant rock. It meant rock. It meant when the tough got going. I mean, there was 12 disciples in that boat, and any one of them could have stepped out. But Peter, with confidence, stepped out and walked on water. What do you call that? Folks, I'm talking, it was changed. Peter was different than the Simon that he was named. To those who obtained a precious faith with us by the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Folks, never take salvation for granted. Faith is precious. Faith is special. God calling you is special. Verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Folks, knowledge is understanding. Thirteen times in 2 Peter, Peter uses the word knowledge. And knowledge is not book smarts. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about getting an education. He's talking about knowing something. He's talking about understanding something. And throughout this first chapter, he's talking about salvation. Make sure you know is what he says three times in this first chapter. Verse 3, as his divine power has given to us all things. Folks, I'm telling you, when you get saved, Christ puts the Holy Spirit in you. You become a part of Christ. Everything you need to be a Christian is there. Now, you're not, you're not mature in Christ. I mean, you just don't instantly make the right decision every time. But the Holy Spirit tells you, man, you're messing up. You are messing up. If you are saved and you sin, I'm telling you, every time the Holy Spirit says you're messing up, as His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life, and here's the word, godliness. What is godliness? Folks, it is moral character. What is godliness? It's doing the right thing. What is godliness? It's doing what God tells us to do in His Word. See, He don't just save us and say, well, I hope you make it, bud. I hope you get it. No, He gives us His Holy Word as our guideline. Listen, folks, I'm giving you my personal testimony, but I'm reading you the Word of God. I'm telling you what God says. What I think really doesn't matter. But what God says means everything. It is a matter of life and death to some people. And that's what he's saying. Given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his glory and virtue. And you have to understand, folks, this is a first-person testimony. Peter walked with Jesus. Peter talked with Jesus. Peter saw the miracles of Jesus. Peter saw Jesus on the cross. 
Peter saw Jesus post-resurrection. Verse 4, by which we have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. What are promises? Folks, I'm telling you, he promised us to never leave us or never forsake us. The Bible tells us that he's coming back again. That is a promise from him. And folks, I'm telling you, it is all in the Word of God. And if God makes a promise, He will keep that promise. That those, these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Boy, Peter is drawing the line in the sand. Peter is saying right here, here's the difference between a lost man and a saved man. A lost man can't help but sin. A lost man gives in to sin and the corruption in the world, but a saved man are partakers of God's divine nature. It doesn't mean that you're perfect. It just means that God puts the Holy Spirit inside of you and that Holy Spirit helps you with decisions that you make in life. Now look at verse 5, but also for this reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith, and it takes faith. You cannot be saved apart from faith. You must have faith. You must put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ our Lord. And to faith, virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, self-control. What is he speaking of? He's talking about seven characteristics that is listed here. These seven things need to be in you if you call yourself a Christian. It's moral character. Moral character produces godliness. And godliness is thinking like Jesus Christ. Faith to virtue. Virtue to knowledge. Knowledge to self-control. Self-control to perseverance. Perseverance to godliness. Three times in the first seven verses, he uses the word godliness. And what godliness is, it is seeking God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. And to godliness, bro brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. Of those seven characteristics, if you look at all of them, folks, you can see them in the life of Jesus. They were in the life of Jesus. Jesus displayed this. You can see him in his miracles. You can see him as he dealt with people. Jesus didn't care how bad a person was. I was witness to, witnessing to a person this week. This week. And here's what he said to me. I'm not sure God can forgive me of everything that I have done. And I said, sir, you really don't understand who God is. God is a God of forgiveness. He can forgive you of every sin you ever committed. And that's what he's saying. These are virtues. These are moral, excellent things in our lives. And if we are Christians, if we call ourselves Christians, these need to be visible in our lives. Look at verse 7. Brotherly kindness and love. Folks, you want to know the epitome of love? God is love. God loved you so much that he sent his son to die on a cross for you and I. For God so loved the world. And folks, I am telling you, here, here he is saying, we as Christians do not need to get ourselves tangled up in worldly things. Hold your finger there and go to 2 Timothy 2 with me. 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2. Verse 1. This is Paul writing to a young Timothy who is starting out in the ministry. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Oh, listen to me, folks. I thank God for the men and the ladies that were in my church I thank God for my Bible school teachers. And folks, I'm dating myself. Anybody remember sunbeams? Church training? These folks put the Word of God in me so that someday I would come to a saving knowledge 
of Jesus Christ. Verse 3, you therefore must endure hardships as a soldier of Jesus Christ. Folks, nobody said it'd be easy. Nobody said that, you know, walking with God would be, you know, a cakewalk. It's not, folks. It's a struggle. It's a fight. It's spiritual warfare. There are storms in life. There are giants in life. But you don't have to face them alone. Verse 4, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself in the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. What is Paul saying? What is the Word of God saying? What is God saying? If you're a Christian, do not get yourself entangled in the world. You forsake the world. You forsake worldly values. You walk with God. You look for godliness in your life. And folks, I'm telling you, one of the reasons I know that I'm saved is because when I got saved, when I was 22 years old, my life changed. Think of the Apostle Paul. His name was Saul. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He knew the law. His job was to put Christians in jail. But on the way to Damascus to arrest Christians, God blinded him with a light and for three days he was blind. And God spoke to him. Paul, Saul, heard his audible voice. And he's saying, why are you doing this? And I'm telling you, Saul gave his life to Christ and became Paul. And you talk about a changed life. You talk about a conversion experience. Paul went on to write two-thirds of the New Testament. He was one of the greatest missionaries, one of the greatest church planners, one of the greatest soul winners that ever walked the face of this earth. Why? Paul was changed. He gave his life to Christ and God changed him. My question today, my first question is, do you pursue godliness? Let me reword this. Are you actively pursuing godliness? It is a sign of salvation. Number two. Number two, a Christian, a true Christian, has a fruitful life. Has a fruitful life. Look back in our text. Back in our text, verse 8. 2 Peter 1, 8. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren or unfruitful. Folks, I'm telling you, that described my life before I was 22 years old. I was empty. I was empty and I was unfruitful. I was not doing anything for the Lord. If anything else, I was hindering the cause of Christ because I would come to church on Sundays and then on Friday and Saturday nights I would do things contrary to the Word of God. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted and even blind, even to blindness. Folks, there are people that just can't see it. They just can't see it. Even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Folks, I had trouble with my past. I would not leave my past alone. And that's what he is saying. You better check it out. Look at verse 10. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call an election sure. What is he saying? Be sure you know God. Folks, I don't think we think of eternity enough. Eternity is forever. It's forever. And he's saying, make sure you know you're saved. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. It doesn't mean you will not sin. It means you will not live in a lifestyle of sin. Folks, that's what I call my B.C. days. Before Christ. I couldn't help but sin. I tried everything I could not to sin. And it did not work. But after, after I died... See, do you realize you have to die to self according to the Word of God? For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior. Listen, folks, you only have one of two choices. One of two choices. There's heaven and there's hell. There's good and there's evil. 
And I am telling you, you need to make sure, you need to know that you know that you know. A fruitful life. There's two kinds of fruit that I want to share with you. The first fruit is in Galatians 5. Go with me back to Galatians 5. This is spiritual fruit. Okay? Spiritual fruit. Go to Galatians 5 with me. Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit. Now here's the fruit. Love, joy, and peace. Before I was saved, I loved who I wanted to, to love. I picked and chose who I wanted to love. Joy was not in, my, not in my vocabulary. It was called happiness. When things were right and circumstances were right, I was happy. Otherwise, I was not a happy person. Peace. I did not have the peace of God in my life. Patience? <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> I was so impatient. And I'm still working on it. Kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against there, there is no such law. What is he saying? And these are spiritual fruits that you need in your life. But do you know there's another kind of fruit also? There's eternal fruit. Eternal fruit. Look at John 15 with me. John 15, go with me please. John 15. John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, which tells me there's more than one vine. Which tells me there's people that think there's more than one way. And one of the things that Peter was trying to tell these folks, he was preaching against false teaching. I'm not going to tell you you're alright if what you have doesn't line up with the Word of God. We must be honest with the Word of God. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes it away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it that it may bear more fruit. Why do we have to have patience? Why does God allow us to go through those storms in life? Why does God sometimes allow bad things to happen to good people? So we will be more fruitful. A dead branch bears no fruit. And when we get to where we're not producing fruit, sometimes God allows situations into our life so that we will depend on God for everything and that we may bear more fruit. Verse 3, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm telling you ten times in this chapter, in this chapter, Jesus said, and John writes, you must abide in me. What is that? That means hang out with him. That means think of what he's thinking. Go places that he allows you to go. Read his word and make it a part of your life. Are you abiding in Christ. A true Christian abides in Christ and produces fruit. Spiritual fruit. The fruits of the Spirit. Moral excellence. They do the right thing. Now look at verse 5. Here's the eternal fruit. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Twice we have offered a witnessing course called a Witnessing Without Fear. To witness without fear. Do you realize that fear keeps us from giving our testimony and keeps us from giving our witness? And what you don't understand is everybody wants to think, man, I'm afraid I'll mess it up. I'm afraid I'll mess it up. Listen to me, folks. You have not saved anyone. I have never saved anyone. That is God's business. That is the Holy Spirit's business. All He is asking me to do is share the eternal fruit with others. Invite people to church. Share your testimony. Share the gospel with folks. And that is eternal fruit. And folks, do you realize when you get to heaven, they're going to be there? That's what eternal means. I mean, you buy bananas. I love bananas. I eat a banana every day. All right? I don't know why. I just like bananas. But you know what I don't like? I don't like brown bananas. Why? They're mushy. They're mushy. They don't don't have the right texture and the taste to it. Folks, I'm telling you, 
Earthly fruit rots. Earthly fruit goes bad. Eternal fruit lasts forever. And folks, I'm telling you, the greatest thing that you can do as a Christian is to invite people to church, to give your testimony of what God has done in your life, and to share the gospel. Hey folks, carry a Gideon Bible. Carry a Gideon Bible. The gospel plan is right in the back of it. You can read it. You can walk down through it. Everyone here knows how to read. And folks, the rest is up to the Holy Spirit. Did you read, not read that last word? For without me, you can do nothing. Nothing. And folks, it's not you. It's God in you. And it is the Holy Spirit that convicts them of sin. So we see here that a Christian has a fruitful life. They are developing those fruits of the Spirit in their life. And they are sharing Christ with others. And then the third thing. And I believe this is the most important. They listen to the Holy Spirit. Look back in our text. Look back in our text in 1 Peter. They listen to the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 1 verse 12. For this reason I will not neglect to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Peter's saying, man, I've talked about this before. And folks, I've been here 12 and a half years, and I couldn't even tell you how many times I presented a gospel message. Peter is saying, I'm giving you this as a reminder. Verse 13, yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you. Folks, we all need reminders, all right? That Jesus is coming soon. That eternal life is forever. That hell is real and heaven is real. Verse 14, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent just as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. What is Peter saying? Folks, he is in a Roman prison. Guess who was running the deal? It was Nero. And folks, he knew he was going to die. He had that feeling that he was going to die. And he was just saying, man, my time is short. I can't waste this time. I've got to tell you the truth of the Word of God. Verse 15, moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. What is he talking about? He's talking about the Word of God. He's writing it. He's pinning this himself through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, I'm not going to be here, but I'm going to leave this for you as a reminder. Verse 16, for we did not follow cunning devised fables which we made known to you by uh, the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So what is he talking about, cunning devised fables? Folks, do you realize the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? There were people that did not believe that. And there were false teachers in the church. And Peter was just saying, Peter was saying, man, we have told you the truth of the gospel. It's the gospel truth. It's not a fable. This ain't made up stuff. We know the power of Jesus Christ. The last part, and were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Folks, Peter saw it. Peter saw Jesus walk on the water. Peter saw Jesus heal a blind man. Peter saw the miracles of the feeding of the 5,000. Peter was eyewitness. I'm telling you, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 that over 500 people saw Jesus post-resurrection. And, G and, and Peter was one of those that knew that Jesus had risen from the dead. That's what he's saying. Look at verse 17. For he received from God uh, the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory and what is he talking about folks he's talking about the shekinah glory of god he's talking about the presence of god peter was there in two places where he saw the shekinah glory one was the baptism of jesus christ hold your finger there hold your finger there and go to matthew 3 matthew 3 matthew 3 verse 16 folks that was 30 years before Peter saw this 30 years earlier. And when he had been baptized, Matthew 3, 16, Jesus came immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. Peter was eyewitness, not just to the baptism of Jesus, but the coming of the Holy Spirit 
up on Jesus. Why could He do what He did? It was the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 17, And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, and when I say a voice, folks, He is talking a literal voice. He heard God say, in quotations, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Folks, I'm telling you, He was saying, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This is the perfect Son of God. And folks, that's what He's saying. He's saying the Holy Spirit spoke. And Jesus, listen, I mean, you think about being baptized. I mean, he was already perfect, but he was baptized to give us an example of what we should do once we accepted Christ into our lives. And then not only that, look at verse 18. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. What is he talking about? He's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. We don't have time to go there, but sometime Matthew chapter 17, read that. And I'm telling you, the Bible says uh, Jesus and Moses and Elijah were glowing with the glory of God. Each one of them. I'm telling you, Moses represented the law. Elijah represented the prophets. And Jesus represented God himself. I mean, that's what it says in John chapter 1. Jesus is God in human flesh. And what he is saying, Peter is saying, Man, I watched his baptism, I watched his miracles, and I'm telling you, I was there when God came down in the Mount of Transfiguration. It was the most awesome sight I have ever seen in my life. Not only was Peter there, by the way, historically James and John were there too. And Peter twice in this first text tells us, man, I was eyewitness of everything that I saw Jesus do. And folks, I am telling you, I believe that Jesus Christ is the divine, holy Son of God. I stake my life on it. That's what Peter's saying. I wasn't there, but by faith, I believe what Peter is saying. And look at verse 19, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. And do you know what happens right before you get saved? I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit speaks to you and it's like you were in darkness and boom, a light comes on. Before you couldn't see it. You couldn't see God for who He was. You couldn't see Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And for the first time in your life, you not only see it, you understand it. And by faith, you put your trust in Jesus Christ. Now notice what he says. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. That's the third time he reminds us, beware of false teachers. Beware of... Somebody that tells you, you know, you just do your best. You just do your best, and it's probably going to be good enough. You just work for the Lord. You just work. You just work at it. It's going to be good enough. Listen, folks, the best you have, according to the Word of God, is like filthy rags in God's sight. You can't work your way into heaven. You can't be good enough. You've already messed up the perfect part. You and I have done that. Folks, you have to come through Jesus Christ the Lord. And that's what scriptures say. See, scripture is our authority. Scripture is accurate. Scripture, God used men. These men wrote down this scripture. It was canonized. It was accepted. And I am telling you, these are thus saith the Lord. I believe the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and every word in between. And he is telling us, that's what he's saying. Verse 21, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Folks, I know no greater example than in the book of Acts. The book of Acts, chapter 2, the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit came. Folks, it wasn't a deal of people speaking in tongues it was, there was all kinds of languages there, and everyone understood in their own language. Read 
the Bible. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Read it slowly and understand what the gift of tongues is. There are false teachers. There are false doctrine. And Peter is saying, man, don't take my word for it. Take God's word for it. His word is right. His word is perfect. His word was written by divinely inspired man as they were moved with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 4, and I close. Acts chapter 4, go with me. Well, go to Acts 1 first. Let me read one here. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power, and that power is the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the world. It didn't say you might. It didn't say if you feel like it. It said that if the Holy Spirit is inside of you, you can't help but share what is inside of you. Acts chapter 4. I'll give you a perfect example. Acts chapter 4, verse 18. Acts 4, 18. So they called them and commanded them not to speak. This is Peter and John. Or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you, more than to God you judge. For we cannot but speak of the things which we have seen and heard. Oh, listen, folks. We have the greatest news ever given to mankind. The greatest news. Some people think, no, winning the lottery is the greatest news. If you die without Christ, you lose Period. I don't care how much money you have in the bank. I don't care how successful you are. I don't care how much respect you have in the community. I don't care what house you live in or the car that you drive. If you die without Christ, you lose. And Peter is saying, you know what? I don't think I'm going to listen to man. I think I'm going to listen to God. Verse 21, so when they had further threatened him, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people since they glorified God for what they had done. Of course, they weren't glorifying themselves. They wouldn't say, hey, see what we have done? They were telling everybody about Jesus. Go down to verse 31. And when they had prayed, that's the key right there, being filled with the Spirit, folks. You can't do it without prayer. You can't do it without prayer. The place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the Word of God with boldness. It did not say they spoke in tongues. They spoke the Word of God. What is our authority? It's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. Now the multitude of those who believed were with one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say to any of these things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. Oh, listen to me, church. Very simple. Ask yourself. Three things. Are you pursuing godliness? As a Christian, are you? Do you have the real deal? Is he truly in your life? And folks, I'm telling you, I don't know. I I suspect most of us are saved. But I don't know. That's between you and God. Number two, is there fruit in your life? Is there spiritual fruit? Is there eternal fruit? in your life. And number three, and I believe this is the most important, do you listen to the Holy Spirit? Do you know that the Holy Spirit is in your life? If you were to die today, do you know that you know that you know that you go to heaven? My prayer is that you can say without a shadow of a doubt, Brother Mike, I know. I am 100% sure. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Peter. Peter was bold in what he said and what he did. Peter didn't mince words. And God, I pray that if there's one here that doesn't know you, God, I pray today would be their day of salvation. God, I know when I was 22 years old, there was such relief in my life. For eight years, I wasn't sure. And God, I pray that everyone here today be sure. God, I pray for the Christian. God, I pray they would be fruitful, Lord. God, I pray that there would be just fruit in their life and people could see Jesus. Lord, maybe they need to rededicate their life today. Maybe someone needs to come for baptism. Lord, Jesus set the example. And God, 
everyone that calls himself a believer needs to be scripturally baptized. That's what the Word says. And God, I pray if there's those here and the Holy Spirit says, you know what, you need to join that church. You've been going there, you've been thinking about it. Just obey the Holy Spirit. Just do what God has told you to do. God, thank you. This is your invitation. This is your church. And God, we will give you the glory for anything that happens. God, it's not about us. God, it's about you. It's about Jesus. It's about the Holy Spirit. God, thank you for the Trinity. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?